us, yes, Lord, to raise up the sisters and to raise your holy name in praise. We ask that you bless us. Let it rise up
those who join us online. And welcome to our Good Friday evening service. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here this evening to celebrate your grace, your faithfulness, and your amazing glory. For it was at the cross that you gave your only begotten Son for our salvation. We understand love in some dimensions, but we don't understand the glory that was demonstrated on the cross. Uh, you loved us to the extent that we may or may not deserve it, but it's through your grace that we've been able to meet the challenges that we face from day to day. Lord, wars are, wars are going on. Folks are hungry. Revolutions continue to go on in Haiti. But we know, Lord, that you are still in control. And we wait for you to decide when you're going to bring resolution to the problems that have faced us today. We invite you in this evening to this service and ask that you bring your spirit and that your spirit prevail because we know not from whence we will be able to do this again, but we do this obviously in memory of what took place on Calvary. Lord, we thank you. We could not thank you enough for the love that was demonstrated and taught to us. Those who will come after me will hopefully share light on what your word meant, what was accomplished on Calvary, and what your efforts to bring peace in this world will continue to provide. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. worship this morning this this evening i'm so used to being up here in the morning this evening join us lord prepare me to be a sanctuary amen if you're able stand to your feet amen and let's give god some praise we're going to sing this song and the ministers who are coming before the lord are singing this same song in their spirits lord prepare me to be a sanctuary amen amen
bless that wonderful name of Jesus. We come on this Good Friday, celebrate his agape love, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. One day we'll exchange it for a crown. This Friday speaks of his agape love. God said to Jeremiah to record, I love you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness have I joined you. On this blessed anointed Friday evening, we're here from seven anointed associate ministers of the Four Foot Baptist Church. Those words that Jesus spoke from the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of our heart rolled away. Hear ye them. Forgive them for they know not what they do, and then they gamble for his clothes. Pray for me. Heavenly Father, I just say thank you, dear God. Thank you, dear God, and we ask that you continue to have your way in this service and continue to have your way with your servant. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So the, the background of the text is, we all know the background is that Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. Uh, they hung him high. They stretched him wide. But before he hung his head and died, he hollered out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I'm just going to, they gave me seven minutes, so I'm not going to hold you long tonight. I'm going to give you three words from this first word. And the first one is Father. Oh, this is God the Son. This is the Son of Man. This is the Son of God calling on God the Father. Some call it an intercessory prayer. He's calling God the Father. He's interceding on the behalf of you and me. He says, Father. So just imagine if you were on your, not just your hospital bed, but your sick bed. The, I'm talking, I'm not talking about just sick. I'm talking about your death bed, good God Almighty. I'm talking about they put you on hospice and the doctors have done all that they can do. And death, you death's on your door. And you holler out, Father, I want you to intercede for my brother. Father, I want you to intercede for my sister. Father, I want you to intercede for my neighbor. He said, Father. And the next word he said is, forgive. So in this first word, the son of man who is literally hanging on the cross with nails in his hands and nails in his feet. Many of us, the first thing that we would want is some retribution uh, or somebody might say I want justice to roll down but Jesus said father forgive this is a God of forgiveness the first thing on his heart and on his mind was forgive father forgive he's interceding and asking for forgiveness for the past present and future sins he said father forgive and when we're looking we're thinking about the fact that he's in the midst of a crucifixion and he's saying forgive how many of us in the middle of a little minor criticism holding grudges and won't speak to somebody for three months because they told you that you sang the wrong note and you did sing the wrong note but you're mad anyway you now they done criticized you and now you're not gonna speak to them in the middle, you can't even take a little criticism, but in the middle of a crucifixion, he said, Father, forgive, for they know not what they do. When we're looking at Jesus, he talked the talk when he, on the Sermon on the Mount. But even with nails in his feet on the cross, he's walking the walk. He's showing us what we should be doing. And like my brother, Reverend Hintz, likes to say, it's not easy to do, but it's easy to understand. He said, Father, forgive. Good God Almighty, it's an intercessory prayer. He said, Father, forgive. And when on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he said, If you forgive those that have sinned against you, then your Father in heaven will forgive you. And that sounds good, but you got to understand that there is a verse 15, amen. And he said in verse 15, If you do not, Forgive those that have sinned against you, then your Father 
cannot forgive you. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the wrong side of God the Father. So if you lay down tonight holding a grudge against somebody, you better remember that that does not line up with what God the Father, what Jesus said we need to be doing. I understand that forgiveness is not always easy. I'm not talking about somebody stepped on your toe in their pew. I'm talking about somebody broke your heart. I understand that forgiveness may not be easy to do. And the thing that we got to understand is put, the, put it in God's hands. Because if you're going to say that I refuse to forgive a person, then Jesus is saying that God the Father cannot forgive you. Understanding that the Bible says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that we've all sinned, so all of us need this forgiveness. But if you don't give it, you can't get it. I'm not saying, it's not what I said, it's what Jesus said. Oh, he was preaching it. He talked the talk and he walked the walk. He told us right there in the middle of his crucifixion, Father, forgive. But the word that I like the most is when it said them. Good God Almighty. I was thinking to myself, I'm looking in the Bible. I said them. Who is them? Good God Almighty. Say them might be the disciples who denied him three times. Them might be the disciples that deserted him. Who is them? Good God. Them might be Pontius Pilate, the ones that convicted him. Who is them? Them might be the ones that wrongfully convicted him. Who is them? Good God. It might be the church folks that said crucify him. Who is them? Good God Almighty. He said forgive them. Who is them? And when I was looking at the text, I said good God Almighty. Who is them? Them is you. Good God Almighty. Them is me. I said who is them? Good God Almighty. I was just looking at the text. He said Father forgive them. So I just stopped by to tell you this evening, if you've been giving your life to Christ, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth and you've given your life to Christ, you can look in the mirror, you can say with your chest, you can say, I am them, good God Almighty. I am forgiven. I, am, I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I do have a new walk. I do have a new talk. I am them, good God Almighty. I am them because he died for me. I am them because they hung high, stretched and wide. I am them. And if somebody say, how do you know that I am them? You can say, I am them because he is him. Good God Almighty. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. I am them because he is him. I am them because they hung him high and they stretched him wide. I am them, good God Almighty, because when Mary looked in the tomb, good God Almighty, the angel of the Lord said, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Oh, I am them because he is him. name of Jesus. Oh, what a powerful word, brother, what a powerful word. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. It is good, good, always good to be in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, church. I thank him that I'm able to see another day, just another day that the Lord has kept me. Thank you and hallelujah, because it didn't have to be that way. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to speak, Lord, through me, for your servant hears. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. I am coming from the second word today, and it is Luke 23, 40 through 40 to 43. But I want to go back to verse 39, just to kind of get that flow into. And it reads thus so. And one of the malefactors, which is a crook, who was hanged, rail, uh, hanged um, railed against him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou fear God, seeing thou art under the same condemnation? 
and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing. But this man hath done nothing. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus, my sweet Jesus, said unto him, Verily, I say unto you, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now let us consider, think about, uh, mull over a little bit, uh, the occasion. We do know, uh, what we do know is that there is nothing in the world and in the heavens that, that our God does not control. There is nothing, just absolutely nothing, that this occasion was not by accident. Our God, <clears throat> excuse me, reigns over everything, and he is sovereign. He knew exactly, exactly what he had decreed and announced, what he announced, all down through history, through his prophets and his written word. God has already said what it's going to be. He knew exactly when, where, and how, and with whom his son would die. Nothing, nothing was in the hand of man. The Bible says in Acts 4, 28, whatsoever man did was simply that which God's hand and counsel had determined to be done. So no, man did nothing, not of us his own volition, not at all. Therefore, all of what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Judas, Pilate, Herod, the thieves, the Roman soldiers, and others did, he foreknew. And get this, that which too many of us are doing is the fulfilling of that which he has decreed. We are in the history books, the Bible, as it has happened and as it is being fulfilled. We are in the books. Let us not forget that he's omniscient. In Isaiah 53, 12, it states also that he, he was numbered with transgressors. So it was already spoken about that he would be numbered with the transgressors and that he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus left the splendor and glory of heaven to save us. Can you imagine it? He left, left heaven to come down here for you and me. Sinners. Sinners. Who were beating him. Pulling his, plucking his beard out. Putting a, throwing a, throwing a crown, a, throwing a, a crown of thorns on his head. But he came down out of glory, out of splendor for you and me, those that would hurt him and abuse him, suffering every kind of imaginable pain and humiliation, being despised and rejected before going to the cross and while on the cross just to save us. That's what our Jesus did. This was the identification with the criminals. There was the identification with the criminals. A picture of being numbered with sinners. Why was Jesus crucified with criminals? The Bible does not say. But whatever the reason, the fact that the Son of God was executed right along with other criminals adds to the shame 
to the reproach of he bore. At his birth, he was, was surrounded by animals. And at his death, he was numbered with the rejects of society. He who knew no sin bore the sins of many. He, Jesus, our sweet Jesus. What we see here is a prime example of us. Verse 39, when he, the malefactor, the crook, who says, the main point is, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Mock at him, smirk him. Oh, you so bad? Save us, save yourself and us. The unre the, he was the, uh, the example of the unrepentant thief. He's the example of you and me when we think we so high and mighty. Oh, God got to forgive me for this. Oh, no, he does not. Oh, no, he does not. No, he's a holy God. His heart was hardened because that means that your, your, your heart isn't right. And his heart was hardened. This is the thief. He's hanging on the cross and his heart is hard. His heart is hardened. Both thieves heard, thieves heard the crowd mocking Jesus about being the Messiah. And they listened to all the crowd's misunderstandings about Jesus' resurrection and Jesus' salvation and his claim of being to being the Messiah. The Savior of the world hanging there. There was all this power he claimed to possess. A man making such a claim while dying seemed to be insane to them. They didn't understand. And neither did most of his disciples. And one of the criminals joined the crowd in mocking Jesus. But, but, but Jesus, if he had come down from that cross, oh, but if he had come down from that cross, our souls would be lost. But he didn't. He decided, he decided that he would not come down from the cross. He decided, my Savior, our Savior, our Redeemer, he stayed on that cross. Now, in verse 40, it states, but the other answering, answering the other crook, on, on the cross, the other criminal. He answered him and rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not know, fear God, seeing thou art under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. They knew they were wretched. But this man, he could see there was something going on that he could see that. But this man has done nothing amiss. This was the repentant thief. Some of us, and that's some of us, repentant. And he feared God. He declared Jesus' righteousness right there on the cross. Ask Jesus and ask Jesus for a place in his kingdom. Again, we see the example of us being represented, represented in the two things. One was the hard-hearted Hannah or hard-hearted Joe. And then the other one was, yes, yes, Father, I will do as you say do. I will follow you. Whatever it takes, Father, I will follow you. But how? They, are, they were both wicked. They were both suffering severely. They were both dying and both needed forgiveness right away. But only one, only one. 
They were both near Jesus and, had, and both of them had access to him and uh, so they could talk to him and could see him and it appears that not neither one of them had closer proximity than the other but that's, that's how we are. That's how we are. Some we just harden our hearts. We don't open up. We don't try. We, we so into ourselves and what we can do. We can't do nothing without, we cannot do anything, excuse me, without God. We cannot. But ironically speaking, we can't do nothing. No, we can't. We have to depend on him. We have to depend on him. I got happy one day in Sunday school where we can depend on God. That song resonated with me. We can depend on him because that's who, that's our source. But it appeared, um, but anyway, many of, of, the, of us hear the sermons. We sit here in church every Sunday. Reverend Lyle's sweating out his, all his clothes. And we're not listening. We're not getting it. And he's preaching just as hard as he can, trying to tell us. We have to get it, what it takes. But we hear the sermon. We even attend Bible study, Sunday school. Some of us are being ministered to and given in-depth teaching on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of us even may see evidence of his miracles. Yet while some hearts will soften and repent and believe, there are others that won't. Won't let anything budge them or move them because they want to stay stuck in their stubbornness and their own self-righteousness. But here is the repentance thief defending God, defending the Lord. His faith and his beliefs are already at work. Hanging on the cross with nails. This is the repentant thief. With nails in his hands. And his feet too. Surely he was struggling for breath. And in agony and excruciating pain too. But his faith gave him the boldness to defend Jesus on the cross. In front of all who were there. The thief was declaring Jesus' righteousness. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And get this. For God sent his Son into the world to condemn the world. Not to, but God sent not his Son, I'm sorry, in his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth in him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the holy, the only begotten son. And in 42, it says, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, this is a repentant thief. Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Here we see this man about to die. He had turned to Christ for forgiveness. And Christ accepted him. This also indicates that our works don't save us. It is our faith that does. Now if you hear long enough. Your faith in him is going to cause you to work. But if it's on the cross, like this, this criminal, his faith was all it took. As long as we are living, it is never too late to turn to God. So do so now if you haven't. Do it. Because he's ever ready to forgive you. Even in his suffering, Jesus' is suffering, Jesus had mercy on him, and he sought him, and seek him while he is able to be found. You are saved by faith, and Jesus 
in verse 43 said unto him, Verily I say unto you, this day, today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh, oh, how awe-inspiring is faith, is the faith of this man who saw beyond the present shame that Jesus was going through to the glory that was coming. And oh, my sweet Jesus, oh, my sweet Jesus, suffering on the cross, he would not come down to save himself. But, but, he decided, he decided that he would not come down to save himself. But he suffered to save all who believe so that he could say to all of us, to him especially, that day, today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. I offer you whatever you're going through, Whatever you're going through, wherever your station in life, make your election sure so that you can be in paradise with Jesus. Because if he take a man off the cross today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Twenty-three through 27. Pray with me, Father, in the name of Lord Jesus, we do again come to thank you for life and all of his goodness. Father, we thank you for the teachings and the word that has gone forth thus far. We pray, O oh God, that 
your anointing would continue to flow within us and through us, and that we might hear a word that would help us on this journey. We give you all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fort Foot family, and I don't use that word loosely. It's a family affair, okay? It's a family affair. Jesus said, woman, behold thy son. And then he's talking to the disciple, behold thy mother. So walk with me just for a moment. You know that families are a divine part of God's plan. The very first people on earth formed a family, Adam and Eve. From the very beginning, God blessed and encouraged families, commanding Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth, Genesis 1 and 28. There are many examples of strong families in the Bible, and the Bible also teaches us how to have a loving, happy family. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Then it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is found in Ephesians chapters 5 and 6. Now the family of God includes all who have believed in him in the past, in the present, and all of those who will believe in the future. Now we're a family because we all have the same father. He is the source of all creation and he promises his love and power to his family, which is the church. It's a family affair, okay? Now having said all that, let's look at the scenarios in our scripture. We've read how Jesus is being crucified on the cross all the pain and agony that he's been going through. But still, through all that pain, he sees Mary, his mother, at the foot of the cross, weeping unconsolably. I'd be doing the same thing. I don't know about you, but that, that would hurt me terribly. Even though Mary knew this would happen, it was heartbreaking. You see, Simeon's prophecy in Luke 23, and, excuse me, Luke 2 and 35 said, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. It was now coming to be. Can you imagine watching your son go through this torture? Can you imagine the pain she's going through. Now, there were others supporting her, but this was her heart breaking. Then Jesus says something that we find so compassionate as he's dying on the cross. He looks out to his mother and he says, woman, out of great respect, he calls her woman, Behold thy son. Then he turns to his beloved disciple and friend, John, and he says, Behold thy mother. Now, according to the Jewish custom, as Mary's firstborn, Jesus is legally responsible for her welfare to ensure that she has a place to live and food to eat during her days as a widow. So from that time on, John took her into his home. We read that in John 19 and 27. So Mary has been put into a new family where she will forever be loved and cared for. Now I thought about this for a minute. I said, why did Jesus assign John this task and not Mary's other children? because you know that Jesus did have sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible says that they had not yet 
believed on Jesus. Now, this is the, the good part. They did not become believers until after his resurrection, okay? Okay, until after. So, his brothers had not believed in him. They weren't even present at the crucifixion. So, Jesus entrusted his mother to someone in the family of God who believed on him. Remember, it's a family affair. You know, I thought about that saying, you can't choose your own family. Makes me wonder, makes me wonder. So these words of Jesus to his mother from the cross are a great encouragement to us. If Jesus, in his state of agony and pain and suffering, could see Mary's pain and have compassion to address it, think about what he has done for us when we were going through our little rough times. He's in pain and suffering. He's, he's, he's weak. His body's physically going through something. But yet, he's got compassion on Mary. But now, right now, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father in full glory and power. So now, we as believers, we have a new family. Who's in my new family? Mm -hmm. All those men and women, boys and girls, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are my new family. I'm in their family. Therefore, we have a responsibility to care for those brothers and sisters, even the elder mothers and fathers who hear and do the word of God in my new family. I'd just like to encourage you to invite others into this wonderful family of God. That means sometimes you need to step out of your comfort zone, take a bold stance as the Holy Ghost directs you, witness to someone, tell them of the goodness of Jesus and what he did for you. Now, to those who are in the family of God, let me tell you something. We spoil. We spoil. It's a family affair, and we know that our Father in heaven will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that he will supply all our needs. We know that if we just ask, he will provide. We know that he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, a light in the darkness. He's the lifter of a bowed down head. He's a doctor in the sick room, lawyer in the courtroom, a way out of no way. This is what we get being in the family of God. It's a family affair. We get joy. We get peace, we get strength. So I encourage you to take on those characteristics that we learned from our Father God and big brother Jesus Christ, to love and care for one another. Because you know what? I need you and you need me. We're all a part of God's family. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. You understand that? I shouldn't harm you. I should make every attempt to love you, to care for you, to feed you. If you need a roof over your head, come and stay at my house for a while. I said for a while. I got to tell you this because my mom always taught me, pay your rent because people will feed you. They don't want you to come stay with them for a long time. But family... Love one another. It's a family affair. Have the compassion that Christ had for his mother in caring for one another. God bless you.
man and took the sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Just bow your head with me for a second. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you in the name of Jesus, thanking you, dear God, for this opportunity to break bread with your word. Hide me behind your cross. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All righty. Um, the fourth word. If I had to put a title on this, I'd say it's dark, y'all. It's dark. So the nails were driven around 9 a.m. in the morning. The cross was then erected and made vertical, and he hung there suspended between heaven and earth. And they continued mocking him, making him a spectacle. He was bruised beyond recognition. And the crucifixion process, as we know, was intended to be the most utmost humiliation that there could be. It was intended to be a form of punishment for the vilest of offenders, for murderers, insurrectionists, those who committed treasonous deeds, those who committed robbery. And the accusation was typically placed on the cross so that all who witnessed and walked by would know what the person had done. It was meant to be a deterrent. Jesus' only accusation was King of the Jews. Even the accusatory title was a form of mockery. They would have been even stripped naked so that their shame would be exposed. And that's why the author of Hebrews tells us that when we run this race, we ought to remember that we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the course, despising the shame. But, and now, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So from the cross at this point, he uttered forgiveness. Father, forgive them. We heard that earlier. He assured salvation to the dying thief. This day you shall be with me in paradise. And he ensured his mother was cared for. Woman, behold thy son. And then the Bible tells us darkness struck. From 12 noon to 3 p.m. he hung in darkness. The land was in darkness. No light shined. I can only imagine that without light, it was cold as well. Three hours in a dark, cold world. It's dark, y'all. The experts say that this wasn't a type of darkness that was caused by a sandstorm or even a solar eclipse. This was a divine darkness. The sun's effect, the S-U-N, sun's effect was absent as if to reflect the effect of S-I-N on the S-O-N. And at the end of three hours is where we find the fourth statement from the cross. With a loud voice, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And we often hear this phrase and we think that Jesus is calling out to the Father as we would, calling for help, we presume. We interpret Jesus' processing of the situation as we would. When we are going through it, our first recourse is to cry and think the worst of it. Oh God, you must be punishing me. God, I must be reaping what I sowed. Oh God, you must be displeased with something that I did. So we often project unto Jesus what we would feel. Why have you forsaken me? Forsaken, abandoned me. How long must you take to address my situation? I want to correct that thought this evening, brethren, because Jesus is in full control. Full control. Brothers and sisters, he has not lost sight of your situation tonight. He has not lost a case. He has not lost a situation. He isn't clueless about you and what you might be going through. Let's not be like the bystanders tonight 
at the foot of the cross thinking some wild, crazy theology. Jesus isn't calling on Elijah. He isn't at a loss for words. He isn't looking for God. The word of God, uppercase W, is soundly and confidently grounded in the word of God. What does God's word say to you and I this Good Friday? What promises can you recall to your mind so that you might have some kind of hope? In this dark world, we need the promises of God, brothers and sisters. We need to know our position in God through Christ. Jesus was quite clear in his teaching about who he was. You say, well, Reverend, what do you mean? He was quite clear about who he was and what he was sent to do. And he tells us in John, the Gospel of John, Gospel according to John, chapter 10, verse 30, he said, I and the Father are one. And he stated in John chapter 10, verse 17, that for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. And then he says, this charge I received from my Father. What has God said to you this evening about your situation? If Jesus is clear about the state of affairs, what in the world is really going on here, brothers and sisters? What's really going on in the midst of this mockery, in the midst of this darkness and scandal? It was the plan all along to go to the cross. Last Sunday, we looked at the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Palm Sunday. And Jesus demonstrated even in that scenario that he was focused to stay the course. The crowds were following him. They were worshiping him. They sang Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They adored the works he did. And they marveled at his wisdom and they enjoyed his teaching. And I thought for a minute, you know, Jesus was doing pretty good. He had a lot of likes. Yeah. He had a lot of likes. He could have decided I could be the top banker of the day. I certainly know how to provide for, fee for people. He could have decided I'm going to be the best doctor that there is. He was good at healing, right? He could have said let me just be the best league of mine because I know how to argue with the Pharisees and Sadducees. I know the law and I could put them to rest. He could have decided, I'm going to run for office because my poll, I'm polling real good. And I know I'm going to win. He could have said, let me just start a new movement and run for office and bring about change. But I reflected on all that he could have done. And even if he did it, you know what? We would still be lost. We would still be lost. He knew his mission was the cross. From the moment he entered Mary's womb, the cross was his destiny. From the night he laid in the manger, the cross was his destiny. From the moment the angels sang to the shepherds on the hillside, the cross was his destiny. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The darkness came because our sin was placed on him. So in those three hours, he didn't sin, but he took our sin. And I wish I had more time to really open this out. It's important to understand that the Father isn't doing this to Jesus, his son. But the Father and Jesus are doing this together. Help me, Holy Ghost. God gave his only begotten son 
And Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. God is submitting to his own wrath because of sin. See, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was instituted to expiate. Pastor taught us that. Partial removal of the sin. But when Jesus came, his mission was the once and for all. The substitutionary payment, the propitiation for our sin. We can't lose focus, brothers and sisters. He came. That's sin. He came because... He became, sorry, your abuse, my abuse. He became your adultery. He became your argumentative spirit. He became your arrogance. He became your assault, your backbiting, your bitterness, your blasphemy, your boasting, your bribery, your coarse joking, your complaining, your contentiousness, your coveting, your deceit, your defrauding, your denying him, your despising the poor. Your dishonoring the elders, your disrespect to parents, your envy, your evil motives, your falsifying your tax payment papers, your fornication, your fraud, your giving grudgingly, your not even giving at all, your gluttony, gossiping, greed, harsh words, hatred, holding grudges, hypocrisy, idolatry. Immodesty, spiritual indifference, your ingratitude, your jealousy, your having a loose tongue, your loss of temper, your lust, your lying, your malice, your manipulation, your mistreatment of children, your defenselessness, your murderous thoughts, your partiality, your prayerlessness, your prejudice, your pride, your racism, your rage, your rape, your rebellion. You're refusing to forgive. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. You're returning insult for insult. Your selfishness, your sexual impropriety, your slander, your slothfulness, your stealing. You're viewing pornography, your violence, your worldliness. You're not loving your neighbor, not loving your spouse. Even your unequally yokedness, if that's a word. It took three hours for him to take all of that. All of that, if you don't find yourself in that. If we don't find ourselves here, you know what it is. For three hours, he bore it all. Paid the price. And I want to tell you all this evening, it had to be this way. No other mode of execution would have been appropriate for the darkness that the sin of this world is today. Jesus' situation under the harsh punishment of Rome was similar to us in sin. He was condemned, so were we. He was rendered helpless, so were we. He was powerless. So were we, he was stripped of his humanity. And so were we, he was declared unfit to live. And so were we, condemned by the law, brothers and sisters, and subject to death. That's where we were. It's dark, y'all. It's dark. I'm trying to paint the picture. See, Jesus took our place under the dictatorship of sin. We had a bad situation. Only he, the perfectly righteous one, could break the curse of sin. And when he took that sin on, the father had to turn his face. He had to look the other way. He had to do to Jesus what one would experience if you die in sin. He can't take it into the kingdom of God. He had to separate himself from his son, his one and only son. So it's in that separation. I'm telling you that Jesus wasn't crying out, but he was singing a song to help him through. 
And he went to the prophetic psalm in chapter 22 and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he goes on and he says, Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? It's a song. It's a song. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, 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 enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put ashamed. That's where we need to be, family. I don't care what we're going through. You got to have a song. You got to have a song that sets your soul free. You got to know his word. You got to know what he says about you. The cross was a huge cross, cost. And we may never really fully comprehend the full breadth of what it cost God and his son. It's dark, y'all. In this dark world, let us strive to be his light this Good Friday. Recall to your mind what God is doing. He is redeeming the world through Jesus Christ. And we have to tell somebody that though it's dark, we have a hope in the cross of Jesus. And we have to tell of his name. That there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It may be dark, y'all, but Jesus is coming back. And as I said, there's work to be done. So in Psalm 22, you jump down to verse 22. The, the song pivots a little bit. And he says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, the fourth word from the cross. What a time, what a, a glimpse of darkness. We come now to the fifth word from the cross. And the fifth word can be found in John 19 verses 28 and 29. John 19, 28, and 29, which reads as follows. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Let's look to the Lord for a moment. Lord, we come to you, not in, in our own self, but in you. Lord, touch, reveal, open up, and Lord, most of all, let you be seen in this word. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For a few minutes, you know, he said, watch out when a a preacher said for a few minutes. (laughs) But I'm going to try. For a few minutes, I'd like to focus on a thought. When living water thirsts, when living water thirsts, this day was now waning toward afternoon from the sixth hour to the ninth the sun has been eclipsed and the air was probably still and heavy oppressive and hot Jesus remained on Calvary weak and faint hanging on the cross through the hot morning hours from between the third and the ninth hour. To make it more clearly, that's from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Jesus' exhausted physical frame, Jesus' lips may have been cracked a little, Jesus' mouth may have been like cotton. Uh, His throat may have been very dry. Uh, He couldn't swallow. Uh, His voice so harsh that it's hard to speak. But Jesus now craves for refreshment. As he says, I thirst. Now, although this was the shortest of Jesus' seven utterances from the cross, we must remember that that it was a moving statement. You see, in the original Greek text, it is one word uh, uh, consisting of five letters, dipso. Uh, One Greek word that is two words, in English, uh, look with me, if you will, at the one who is giving us this word. The fifth word came from one who claimed that he who believes in me shall never thirst. But that living water which he gives will be a perpetual, ever-flowing fountain that can never run dry. This word is telling us that living water was thirsting. That is the living water that Jesus does give. To secure it for us, Jesus had to pass through a dry and thirsty land where no water is. That's Psalm 63, 1. This fifth word is coming from one who said, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. This is the same Jesus who said, If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. We we now find the one who gave water or made provision for others to obtain the water himself, saying... I thirst. Thus we see again here, living water was thirsting. How can living water thirst? I'm glad you asked me that question. Exodus 17, 1 through 8 helps us to understand as we are reminded of the Israelites who God delivered from Egyptian bondage, who continually complained and whined. You know how they are. God tells Moses to get the elders and that he, God, will stand on the rock. Moses is commanded to strike the rock. The rock representing Jesus was struck before the elders and their thirst was quenched when water came forth. Judgment had to be satisfied before water would flow. Y'all didn't hear that. 
judgment had to be satisfied before water would flow. Jesus was bearing our judgment on the cross. You see, the living water became thirsty to take our thirst. Y'all missing another good one. The living water became thirsty to take our thirst. Well, what irony that the maker of oceans, lakes, rivers should have parched lips. That he who said, I am the water of life, should himself be thirsty. What, what, what might be some of the physical causes for Jesus saying, I thirst? Well, the Journal of American Medical Association once carried an article where doctors speculated that about the symptoms Jesus must have had on the cross. They noted that Jesus suffered great emotional stress, pardon me, as evidenced by sweating blood, undoubtedly in intensified by his disciples abandoning him, and the humiliating physical beatings, the brutal scourging, would have caused intense pain, appreciable blood loss. This would contribute to shock or, or trauma. Uh, other con contributing factors could include severe dehydration, stress-induced arrhythmia, congestive heart failure with rapid accumulation of fluids. Even from a purely human viewpoint, it is not surprising that from his cross, the living water would say, I thirst. There, 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 there are no surprises here. In this, this fifth utterance, nothing out of or the ordinary. This is an expected response from a dying man. It was out of dehydration that the living water says, I thirst. But John tells us in 19 chapter 19 verse 28 that there were some prerequisites to Jesus uh, acknowledging his thirst. John says it starts out like this. He says after this. Well after what? After Jesus had provided for his mother for the rest of her earthly pilgrimage. After he had taken notice that his suffering was her, uh, was to her as a sword piercing her own soul, as spoken by Simeon. Uh, after the, after the Christ at Golgotha of Calvary of everlasting mercy, human sorrow cares and provides for his mother like all children should do by placing her in the care of John, the beloved disciple according to Exodus 20, 12. Secondly, John records, in, uh, John records further, knowing that all these things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. In a moment of agony, Christ our Savior came to the realization that all things were now accomplished. The picture here is of one of Jesus in complete command, consciously fulfilling the program, the agenda that the Father has set out for him. The purpose claimed, the purpose claimed his full attention and he did not yield to the forces that tried to confuse him but had brought about his arrest and even his crucifixion. Jesus said in John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Luke 19, 10 tells us that Jesus came in the world to seek and save the lost. His whole world, his whole life and thirst had been given to saving people from their sins. His love, compassion for people were never overshadowed by his own thirsty needs. Every detail of his ministry had been for the fulfillment of scripture right down to his own thirst. 
when the living water acknowledged his thirst, he, uh, he fulfilled Psalm twenty-two fifteen. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of the de- of death. When the living water acknowledged his thirst, he fulfilled six, Psalm 69, 3, I am weary of my crying, my throat is dry, mine eyes fail, while I want for my uh, God. There are chapters in the Old Testament where I'm, where, where, uh, which are really especially concerned with the crucifixion. Did you know? Did you know that there are 28 prophecies fulfilled um, while he was hanging on the cross? Apparently, his, his mind had also run over other prophecies as if Jesus was going down his prophecy checklist. Was there anything in Genesis that was left out? No. Was there anything in Exodus that was left out? No. Uh, What about Deuteronomy? No. At last he reached Psalm 69, 21, where it is said, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Already they had offered him gall to deaden the pain, but there had been no offer of vinegar for his thirst. They tell us that he didn't even drink it. It was supposed to moisten his lips. John tells us that a vessel of vinegar was lifted on his knee uh, uh, on a reed with a sponge to ease Jesus Christ. Sour wine, vinegar, was the Romans' common drink. History tells us that Jerusalem's water contained bacteria and the Roman soldiers would mix sour wine, wine that had passed its time and became vinegar with well watering water, hoping to kill the bacteria. This sour wine was a sort of, if you will, sort of first century Gatorade. Jesus took a sip to find a moment of relief from the burning thirst It is believed by some that Jesus took it because he had two more things to say. When Jesus uttered the fifth word from the cross, we see humanity expressed by the living water. How important could that be? Well, Jesus got thirsty, y'all know. Since Jesus got thirsty, you know you get thirsty. So So what I get thirsty... And so when do I get thirsty? That's the point. Jesus, the living water, was just as human as you are. Underlining, underlining the physical thirst in another kind of thirst. But when, when did, as I hurry to close this, when, why did the living water endure these feelings? Jesus, the living water, knew you would be weary. He knew you would be disturbed. He knew you would be angry. He knew you'd be sleepy like some of you might be right now. (laughs) Grief-stricken, hungry. He knew you'd face pain. If not the pain of the body, the pain of the soul. Pain too sharp for any drug. He knew you'd face thirst. If not a thirst for water, at least a thirst for truth. And the truth we glean from the image of a thirst Christ. He understands and because he understands, we can come to him in that case. So, so having said that, what, what did he, what did he, he, he thirst for? For the end of the journey. For the culmination of his purpose for the solidification of God's eternal plan, for the opportunity to deliver man from his endemic nature, uh, for the living water's greatest thirst, uh, the chance to atone for man's sins, for the rebirth of his father's creation. Not only that, 
But Christ was thirsting, yes? What was he thirsting for? He was thirsting to become the fountain of our joy. He was thirsting to become the strength for our suffering. He was thirsting to become the satisfaction for our soul. He was thirsting to become the object of our worship. He was thirsting to become the sacrifice for our sins. Thirsting to become the door to our deliverance. Oh my God. He was thirsting to become the author of our salvation. Thirsting to become the well of everlasting life. Thirsting to become our strength and our victory. Our living water. When living water thirst, Christ thirsted because of our sin, because of our circumstance, because of our guilt, because of our weakness, that we might never thirst again. So I say to you, my beloved, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? When's the last time you went to see the living water? Do you know what? He's still providing water. He's still providing water for those who are thirsty. Have you had a drink lately? Have you got on your knees sometime and went and drank from the fountain? Have you gone to the well of Jesus Christ and drank from the fountain? Are you thirsty? Someone said, as I walked to my seat, that I thirst is God's app for our thirst. Our thirst is God's app for that thirst. So the next time you are thirsty and reach for a glass of water, Think about the truth that Jesus thirsted physically that we might have our spiritual thirst quenched not for just a day, but for all eternity. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, I, he saith, I thirst. When living water thirsts.
The sixth word from the cross. It is finished. It was a perfect ending to a perfect life. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. God, I ask that you speak tonight, God. Continue to speak, God. Continue, God, to shine a light on your word, that your word will become living inside of us as we hear, as we read. God, we thank you and we bless you, and now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. This sixth word is coming from um, first, um, John, not First John, John chapter 19, verses 30 through 37. It's quite a few verses, but I think it's important that we hear them all. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the, the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true, that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night. And he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. May God's already blessed word continue to bless you. So this is a long scripture, but the verse that I'm going to concentrate on, of course, is that very first verse. After he had received the vinegar, he said, Tetelesta. As Reverend Robinson said, the, 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 the Greek word is just one word. It's not these three words. It's tetelestai, tetelestai, depending on who you ask. This English phrase, it is finished, really does not capture the fullness of what the Greek word meant. It meant it is finished, but it stands finished, and it will always be finished. You have to understand the completeness of this particular thing that Jesus was saying. But, but the real question that came to me is, what is finished? Was, it, was he talking about just the, 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 the crucifixion, these hours that he's been hanging on the cross and uh, uh, the time that he has spent, he's tired, he's fighting for breath, they've beaten him, and, and, and it says the physical torture that his body has taken, so much so that he was unrecognizable. Is that what he's talking about? You know the stories where it talked about his, his sweat, what, dropped like blood. And, and that they buffeted him and they beat him along the way. They smote him, Matthew says. And, and then uh, his blood, when, the, when, when Pilate said, I washed my hands of him, the people said, no, his blood, what, will be on us. His blood will be on us. And they continued to scourge him. Even the soldiers, again, they planted that crown of thorns and they put it on his head. He continued to bleed. They hit him on the head. And then they crucified him. Nails in his hand. Blood came streaming down. Nails in his feet. Blood came streaming down. Is that what he's talking about? Is that what's finished? Oh, they're finally done? They're going to stop now? Is that what they're talking about? 
Well, to really understand what, what, what is actually encompassed here in this word, we got to understand, first of all, why did Jesus even come to earth? What, what, what did he come for? And what was his pur- purpose for leaving heaven? What was the task that the Father had given him? Now, all these preachers have come, and we've heard it over and over, and, and, and I'm going to probably repeat some of the things they said, but I'm going to try my best if I can, if I heard it already, just I'll reference back and but, but let's do this with me. Go, go back in your mind. Go back in your mind. 21 years from, from this time. Go back 21 years from that Passover when Jesus was what? He was 12 years old. You know the story. When his mom and daddy left, they went back home. They couldn't find him. And they, they thought he was with the crowd. That was one day. Then they go back to Jerusalem looking for him three more days. So it's four days they have not seen their child. And they find him, where? Well, come on, somebody, at the temple. He's at the temple. And he's talking with doctors. And I, and I know my time is short. But, but this story, when I heard, when I read this story again, it reminded me of, of, a, of a situation I had with one of my sons. We, we went to a NASA day on the hill when I used to work for NASA. And so I took my kids and my mom with me. We taking the kids and we're ready to go. You know, they have all the, you know, trying to smooth the, the congressman, right, to get money for the, for the agency. And um, I, I, I can't find, and if y'all, any of y'all know my children, you know which one was lost. It was Tyrese. Tyrese couldn't find Tyrese. Tyrese gone and we're looking around. Where's Tyrese? So Taurus and Talia standing with mama and I'm looking. And so I see these group of men. It was about six or seven men talking. And the NASA administrator at that time was Charlie Bolden, our first and only black NASA administrator. But anyway, they're standing, but all of their heads are bent down. So my son is in the middle of these men. Just, I don't know what he was talking about, but he had all of their attention and they're all listening. That's what it reminded me of when I think about Jesus being at the temple with doctors, the learned men. He's asking questions and I know Tyrese was asking some questions and pretending like he know what they're talking about. Because he couldn't have been no more than about eight or nine years old. And, and when the mama found him, she said to her, him, don't you know we've been looking for you? But, but here's what this 12-year-old Jesus said. He said, didn't you know that I had to be here? I had to be. I'm dealing with the things of my father. I had to be in my father's house. What? I had to be about my father's business. Jesus already knew he had an assignment to do. Here he was at the temple at 12. And so for the next 18 years, we really don't know much about Jesus. He grew in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and with man. He did the things that he needed to do to prepare for what God had called him to do. I just like that. I, I, I like that. But the mama and the daddy, when he said, I, I, I got to be about my father's business. I know the daddy said, I, I didn't tell you. <laughs> it wasn't my business. They didn't know what he was talking about either. My point I'm trying to say is he was sent. Jesus was on an assignment. So we still need to find out what this is. So I'm going to, at the pastor, I'm going to try to cut across the field. Y'all, I'm going to try to cut, but God knows I'm going to try to cut across this field. He was sent to return us to the Father. Know why? Because Adam's sin separated us from God. From the beginning, God, we were with, don't y'all know, Adam and Eve were in the very presence of God. And when they sinned, what did they do? They had to hide. And God came walking through, if y'all remember the story. Where are you? He was looking for them. But because, come on, that's why that fellowship was broken. So we all became children of wrath. We were no longer, and I don't care what anybody says, we all humans are not children of God. We can become children of God, but we are now the children of wrath. We have been orphaned from God the Father. And so for us to even have an opportunity to become children of God again, Jesus had to come. Now, now, Paul summarizes this, so this is in hindsight, 
in Colossians, he, he does a very good job. Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 22 says, uh, For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him, that's Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be the things in earth or the things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by your wicked works, yet now hath he, Jesus, reconciled in the body of his flesh, get this now, through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. This, this thing says in the body of his flesh through death. Not through Jesus' life will we be reconciled. We will only be reconciled through his death. So, 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 okay, so let's look back. Let's look back. God established with the children of Israel. Remember, he called them a special people unto myself. He called the children of Israel to give them his people. And Reverend Robinson already told you, Jesus was on the cross. He looked back in Genesis. Okay, what did I, what did I, did, I, did we hit the check mark in Genesis? Because in Genesis, God gave them the law at Mount Sinai. Everybody remember that? God gave Moses, come on, y'all saw the movie. What's the name of the movie? You know, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, with that man pretending like he was Moses. But anyway, um, gave him, gave him the, the law at Mount Sinai. And all the people said what? Yes, we'll do it. We'll do it. We agree. Did they do it? No, they didn't do it. They didn't do it. The people didn't do it. So then God had to establish some laws. And he said, for these things that you do, you will be, there will be some punishment. Here, here's the behavior that I want you to exhibit. But he also gave them a way to worship. He gave them the tabernacle. Anybody remember that? Now we're in Exodus. They gave him the tabernacle. So he gave them uh, 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 the tabernacle. You got the holy of holies. You had a mercy seat. You got the priest, all their garb. You got the altar. You got all the sacrifices. You got five different offerings. So if, as you go and read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, it's all there. God is laying it out. What he wants us to do. What? We all trying to just get back to God. We're trying to have an opportunity, what? To be in his presence. Because his presence is where? In the holy of holies. So everybody can't get there. So under the law, it, almost most of the stuff that got messed up under the law had to be purified by what? By the blood. Everything had to be done by the blood. They got to bring it to the altar. They got to kill the lamb. They got to kill the goats. They got to kill the sheep. They got to kill the bulls. But why? Why the blood? Because the life of a thing, mm, the very life of a thing is in the blood. I, I, I'm a, uh, 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 right now, I'm a, I'm a cancer warrior, right? I'm fighting this thing called multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is one of the cancers of the blood. When I got this disease, I realized, I said, you know, Satan, you a dirty, dirty dog because you know the life of a thing is in the blood. If I can mess up her blood, she can't live. And actually, to this day, they don't have a cure. We treat it. Thank you, God. Come on, we still, we still, because God has not said it is finished. Hey, you got to wait till God says it's finished. But the life of a thing is in the blood. And, it, and, and the word of God says, without the shedding of the blood, what? That's the thing. There's no remission of sin. See, it's that sin thing that's separating us from being in God's presence. Because we serve a holy God. And a holy God cannot just take any kind of thing. I think somebody said it already. You can't just take your junk. And I believe the, the, the specific laws that talks about how we, how we atone for those sins is in Leviticus chapter 16 and most of us have known about this thing called Yom Kippur right the Jewish people even today it's that day of atonement where the priest has to go in and there's right there's all these things that have to be done they come in they sprinkle the blood he's sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat first he sprinkles it on each side. he has to sprinkle it seven times it's all kind of all kind of things that he has to do and that mercy seat is the thing that's sitting in the holy of holies 
on top of the Ark of the Covenant where God's very presence resides. That's what we're trying to get to, y'all. Come on. God is trying to let us get back to his very presence. And God would only accept blood from a spotless lamb. The lamb can't be any kind of raggedy. You ain't got nothing else to do but bring the one you don't want either. Come on, I was talking to somebody about those of us who put things out there in that, in that giveaway box to the Salvation Army. You don't wear the shoes. Why you think somebody else would want to wear them? You wore the heel all the way over. They run over. The coat got a rip in the back and just, he don't want your junk. God says, I need you to bring me a spotless lamb. Because this life of everything is in the blood, it is only the blood that is going to make atonement. And the offering, the specific offering that is offered is called the burnt offering. And that burnt offering has some things, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. But I'm talking about the it, and it is finished. I'm trying to still figure out what's finished. What is finished? It is finished. And interestingly enough, in, in, in the story, uh, uh, in, in all four of the Gospels, talking about the crucifixion, this tetelestai is only mentioned in John. Matthew doesn't mention it, but Matthew does tell us about the veil in the temple, right? When the veil, it, it ripped from top to bottom. Matthew doesn't mention it, but he talks again. He tells us about that veil. Even Luke doesn't mention it, but Reverend Brown going to tell you what, what, uh, what, what Luke talks about, and I'll leave that to him when he comes up for the next one. Only John tells us about Tetelestai. But let's also remember this, that when you look at the book of John, the one thing he does in chapter 1, the, the book of John tells you what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus for the first time. What did he say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, I want, you to, I want you to catch what I just said. The Lamb of God taketh away the sin. Now, Reverend Nigel got up here named about 75 of them. <laughs> of the sins with an S. But what, God, what Jesus was coming to do was take away the sin because you might commit any one of those. Nobody can try to name all of them. They've been trying to kill all these animals down through the years for every sacrifice. If you were a thief, if you were a whoremonger, if you were a liar, whatever you did, you trying to find a way to, to redeem man, to redeem man, to get man back. You can't name a sin, no, that Jesus can't cover. You, y'all should be up shouting right there. That was a shout. I said it slowly so you could catch it. There's not one sin that you do. I don't care how low down you think you are, but there's not one sin that Jesus hasn't come to cover. And John the Baptist proclaimed who Jesus was and what he was coming to do. I think we're getting to the it, y'all. I think we're getting to the it. Isaiah 53, 11 tells us, by, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, if you have time to do Bible study, and this is, if I had, you know, a little more time, God have mercy. Isaiah chapter 53 tell you everything that Jesus was doing. It is so good. I, I had it down and I said I ain't going to have enough time. I, I, I got to let that go. But y'all go, go, go look up. Go, go look up Isaiah 53. Because Isaiah was prophesying about what Jesus was sent to do. What the it was that is talking about in Tetelestai. Back in Genesis chapter 22 verse 7. Back in Genesis. Back in Genesis. Isaiah I mean, Isaac, Isaac asked his father, Abraham. Y'all remember the story when they went up to go up in the mountain to do the sacrifice? Isaac said, but daddy, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb? John said, here he is. Behold the lamb that taketh away. Come on, somebody. Y'all supposed to be shouting over that. The sin of the world. What? 
That burnt offering, that burnt offering we're talking about, that burnt offering is defined in Leviticus. It is the atonement for your sin in general. That's what it says. The, the, the burnt offering will cover all the sins. But it's also an expression of our devotion to God and our commitment and surrender to God. When we gave that burnt offering, that's what we said we were doing. We were surrendering ourselves. So Jesus ministered for all these years. He performed all kinds of miracles. He was teaching. He was preaching. He talked about the kingdom of heaven. He proclaimed himself to be the son of God while also being the son of man. He had to fully pay the price that we could never pay. He had to be a man so that he could, what, pay that price and fulfill everything in the law. Because Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So as Reverend Robinson said, it's like he's going down the checklist. Have I done this? Have I covered this? Have I covered that? And Hebrews tell us that, that he was made like uh, his brothers in all respects. That hey, he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So Jesus became that high priest that could go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, on, on the Day of Atonement to make that. And John says he is the propitiation for our sins. But uh, not only, but, but listen. The, 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 the Old Testament was pointed toward the Jews, the children of Israel. But here in 1 John, he says, not only for us, but also for the whole world. This, this is, he's speaking, God is going beyond, he's going above and beyond what he required. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son. Hallelujah. To be the propitiation for our sins. The entire word of God is there. If you look at Genesis to Revelation to show us what he did. But specifically on this day, when I was telling you about when the, when the priest had to go in and they had to, 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 to shed this, uh, to sprinkle the blood, it was seven times that he had to take the finger, right? And so Jesus, come on somebody, shed this blood seven times. I, I already talked about it, right? Where Jesus' blood vessels burst, right? And, and dropped like sweat like blood they struck him in the face and plucked out his beard and he was bleeding they scourged him and beat him with the cat of nine tails come on somebody and he began to bleed they put the crown on his head and the blood came streaming down I spoke I got you I got you they drove nails in his hands he started bleeding they, they drove nails in his feet that's number six and then after he died because mine show the, the word I'm giving He's going to already be dead, but Reverend Brown, I'm going to bet you let you finish it up. When they, when they had to go identify whether he was dead or not, they put a spear in his side. That's number seven. We saw the blood in the water come out. So Jesus was the seventh time sprinkling in it on the mercy seat for you and for me so that it is complete. His earthly mission began and now, and now, his earthly mission is completed. He was obedient unto death on the cross. He submitted through all the pain, the ridicule, the insults, all that. But he had to make sure he satisfied his father completely. The assignment that God, the father, gave Jesus before the foundation of the world was now complete. I call this a perfect ending. I call this a perfect ending. Why? Because a perfect doesn't just mean perfect like we said, no errors. But it means complete fully satisfied it was a complete and fully satisfied ending a perfect ending before a perfect beginning I got to tell you why it's a perfect beginning I, I couldn't stop at the perfect ending it said tetelestai it is done it's complete everything has been done but remember I told you Matthew and Mark didn't mention this but they mentioned the veil in the temple that's the perfect beginning the perfect ending that Jesus has done everything but that veil in the temple tearing now says that perfect beginning is for you it's for me because everything else all that was for the Jews but now God has said he's torn that veil that we can all come what boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy and find help in the time of need it is finished Tetelestai
You can keep on praising the Lord. Lay behind a storm You live to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me took the fall and thought of me above all. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. Lord, we want to say just thank you for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. 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 I thank the Lord. I pray that none of y'all don't be doing no nodding on me, y'all. Amen. Amen. Every now and then I'm going to say amen just to check you. Amen. Amen. Just to check you to make sure that you don't be nodding and falling on the side and knocking people out on the side of you. Amen. 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 Luke 23, verse 44 through 49. And it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar all beholding these things. Amen, amen, amen. Let me pick the, paint the picture a little bit for you. Luke the physician focused on three of the statements said on the cross. He didn't focus on the physical agony, but he focused on what the cross meant. The first, the second, and the seventh word of Christ's sacrifice. He talked about Christ's sacrifice justifying the wicked. He talked about Christ's sacrifice transferring the righteousness to sinners and removing the curse and disarming the devil. He talked about Christ's sacrifice and the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. You see the crucifixion was six hours long. He spoke only seven statements while he was on the cross. Let me, let me paint the picture a little bit more. He was hanging on the cross. He's been beaten and whipped, forced to carry his own cross. He has had nails driven through his right hand and through his left hand and through his feet. He's dripping, dripping both with sweat and blood. He must push up on the nail with his feet just to grasp for a breath. Then he says, Jesus called out in a loud voice. Not a soft voice, in a loud voice. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. You see, this was the last word of Jesus on the cross. The seventh word. And we all know, as our pastor so often tells us, that the number seven means perfection. The number seven means completion. There are eight words in the seventh saying of Jesus on the cross. The number eight, as our pastor always tells us, means new beginnings and resurrection. The seventh word is the fulfilling of prophecy from Psalms 31 verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of all truth. That's Psalms 31 verse 5. It's a nighttime prayer that was said by the Jewish children before going to bed. It was the first scripture that was learned by Jewish children. It's similar to our nighttime prayer. Now I want you to help me out a little bit and hopefully this will wake you up. That we learn as a children. Now I lay me. I pray to the Lord. If I should die. I pray to the Lord. 
now. They don't do much of that praying right now. They don't pray much at all right now. You know, they don't talk about bless mommy, bless daddy, or none of that kind of stuff that in the world that we're living in. You see, Jesus is praying as a Jewish child would pray, but changes it because he's talking to his father. There was a lot going on and a lot that had already gone on. You see, the fourth saying was, was my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had been in the hands of men. They had beat him. They had humiliated him, mocked him, placing a crown of thorns on his head. And he still prayed, Father, forgive them. But he had fulfilled 322 Old Testament messianic prophecies. Now, they say that it's, it's one in probably about, about a thousand or so, you know, chances that a man couldn't even, couldn't even fulfill one. But Jesus, through his lifetime, when he was born and, and, and how he was born and even how he would die, you know, he fulfilled 322 Old Testament messianic uh, prophecy. I tell you, he measured up. The Jews should have saw that this was the, the Messiah. This was the one that they were looking for, but they missed it. You see, they, you know, that it said that, he, that Jesus died and, and he was forsaken, but he was not forgotten. You see, he fulfilled the word of God through prophecy by reconciling us as the sacrificial lamb. He focused on the will of God all his life, even in death to rescue us from our sins, to finish the work of God, to redeem us and satisfy the law, to free the way to God by, by offering a power, the power of his sacrifice. You see, we receive salvation and a relationship. Our destination was to be eternally separated from God. But, but he decided to die. He demonstrated God's love in a declaration of victory. He cloud, cried in a loud voice. I can't help but, you know, even, even when, when seeing this, I said he cried, he, he cried out and he prayed in victory. You also need to know, you know, also in Luke, this was the third, this was the third prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. It was three prayers. The first one, as we had already uh, learned in the, in the first word, was Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was a prayer. When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was a prayer. And now he's saying, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. You see, this word commend means that he's going to commit. He says, I commit. He's saying, I commit to your will. He says, no man take my life, but I lay it down. Then it said that he breathed his last breath. You see, this word commit means to deposit something valuable. In a safe place. It's what you do when you put your will or all your valuables in a safe. Now, you know, do any of you all have safes at home? You, you know what I mean? Amen. I'm um, just checking on you to see if you're still with me. You know, it, it means to commit your valuables in a safe deposit box. Commit in a safe keeping to render up or to lay down. You see, so Jesus, he was committing his life to the Lord. He was committing his life to the Lord so that we can have a relationship. He was punished for our sin. He, he, he didn't do anything wrong. He, he also, not only for our relationship, but also so that we can have a, a, a rest. You know, the wine and said it was not a haphazard event, nor a secondary scheme, but it was the plan of the Lord to redeem. It was God's plan of salvation for him to die on Calvary's cross so that we will have a relationship, so that we will have rest, and also so that we can have redemption by the power of his sacri sacrifice. You see, the Allstate Insurance commercial says, you're in good hands with Allstate. Okay, we, we all probably hear that. But I'd rather be in God's all-sufficient hands. I'd rather be in God's all-sustaining hands. His loving hands. Jesus satisfied God's holy requirement. Jesus was the sacrifice that made a difference. Has he made a difference in your life? Has he changed your life? Has he taken your life when you all messed up in your sins and turned you all, all around? Lord, it's in your hands. If I could use a topic, that's what I'd say. Lord, it's in your hands. Or more so in the day that we're living in, put it in his hands. Put it in his hands. Put it in his hands. He says, Father, forgive them. 
for they know not what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. You see, the first word talked about forgiveness. The second word talked about salvation. The third word talked about relationship. The fourth word talked about abandonment. The fifth word talked about distress. The sixth word talked about triumph. And the seventh word talked about reunion by committing ourselves to the Lord. Before he gave his life, the Bible says that while he was on the cross, darkness was, was from noon to 3 p.m. An unnatural eclipse was taking a place. It was a miracle because eclipse, did, they, they don't normally happen like they did. Then it says the veil was torn from top to bottom, not bottom to the top, but from top to bottom, meaning that God ripped it open so that we could come in. It said the graves were opened up, and then those who were dead was walking around. People were, were we rose from the dead and was going into the city. When you see, what, what, what Jesus was trying to do was let us know that when we die, we need a heavenly father who we can call on. Jesus hung there. He hung there. So we could have a sincere faith. He hung there so that we could have a secure future. He hung there so that we can submit to the will of God. He hung there to sacrifice, to be the sacrifice, to open a way to God. He hung there to satisfy and to fulfill prophecy. Look at the person next door and say, you need to put it in, 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 his, in the Father's hands. Say, so you need to put it in the Lord's hands. No matter what you're going through, say the same thing. Say, no matter what you're going through, you need to put it in his hands. It may be hard, but you need to put it in his hands. You need to put it in his hands because he's able. Keep on talking back to him. Say, because he's able. Say, he's able. He's able. He's able to do exceedingly more. Then we could ever ask a thing. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. I got, I got this one little, little, little story. It says a little boy and his father visited this country store. Upon leaving the store, the owner of the store offered the little boy some free candy. Get, get a handful of candy, the merchant said to the boy. The boy just stood there looking up at his father. The owner repeated himself, son, get a handful of candy. It's free. Again, the boy did not move, continued to look up in the face of his father. Finally, the father reached into the candy jar and got a handful of candy and gave it to his son. As they walked back home, the father stopped and asked his son, why, 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 why didn't you grab a handful of the free candy? The boy with a big smile on his face, he looked into the, the face of his father and he said, because I know that your hands are bigger than mine. Don't you know that no matter what you're going through, that the God's hands are bigger than our hands. He's able, he's able. You see, that's what Jesus was saying. That's why he committed it unto the Father. Because I'm safe in the Father's hand. God is our protector. No matter what we're going through, God has given us promises in his word. In a time of trouble, it says that he will hide me in the secret of his pavilion. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous can run in it and be safe. God is our refuge and our deliverer. Am I right about it? God is our refuge and our deliverer. Our soul is entrusted to God. God would give us power. You see, Jesus knew that it was Friday, but Sunday was coming. He knew it was Friday, but Sunday was coming. When he was going to get up, with all power in his hand. He was going to get up with all power in his hands. Jesus called out in a loud voice. Father into your hands. I commit my spirit. I give you my spirit. When he said this he breathed his last. You see I got one more illustration. You see I, I said well Lord. Lord. Why should I put it in his hands? And Lord, I know it's in your hands no matter what I'm going through. 
that the Bible says that even the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So, so my steps are ordered by the Lord. I'm going through some things just as Jesus was going through Calvary on our behalf. And But God wants us to understand that there's sometimes we, even when we don't understand the purpose, don't you know that all things work together for good? The devil thought he had Jesus when he put him on the cross, when he put the nails in his hand. He thought he had Jesus when he put the nails in his hand. He thought he had Jesus when he put the spear in his side. You, but the Bible says that Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, I'm coming home, Lord. I'm coming home into your hands. I commit my spirit. Don't you know the reason why? The reason why he did what he did. I got an illustration. I think it's two ushers in the back. Got a little something. And if you could just bring what you have in your hand and just put it one on this side in front of the flower pot and one on this side in front of the flower pot. You see, God had a plan. He had a plan. Jesus committed himself. He committed himself just as the ushers were walking that aisle. He did it to usher us in, to usher us in. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God knew that we could not have hope on our own. So he had to die on Calvary's cross to give his life for us. Us worthless sinners. I don't know about you. I wasn't deserving of his salvation. I wasn't deserving of him dying on the cross. I wasn't deserving of him being spat upon. I wasn't deserving of, of him having a crown of thorns on his head. But because of his love. God waited. He was patient with us. Some of us was, some, uh, was a mess, I tell you. Am I right about it? I mean, we were a mess, I tell you. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm talking about you, I'm talking about myself, I'm going to wave like this. If you know that you were a mess, you were a mess before Jesus came into your life. You were, I mean, you were a mess. You used to drink, smoke, do it, cursing, do all kind of crazy and stupid things that even now you can't even understand when you look back on your BC days. Lord, what kind of fool was I? I wasted so much time in my life. I wasted saying so many stupid things. But thanks be to God. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things, all things. Now, now say all things with me if you know that God has done some all things in your life. All things, all things are made new. And he's not finished, y'all. Am I right about it? Now, now, if you know that God ain't finished, would you just wave at me? Boy, everyone should have a hand on right now. Uh, he ain't finished, he's not finished. We, God has blessed us so. We're living in a world. We're living in a world where you need to commit, y'all. You need to live a life that's a committed life. Not, not a life that's straddling the fist. Not a life that said, well, you know, uh, maybe tomorrow I'll give my life to the Lord. And, and maybe, you know, uh, you know, when I get old. and There's no such thing. Old is what you are right now. You don't have but right you ha what you have right now. We, uh, it, I mean, it don't make much sense. When you look at news and you look at all the things that we hear and we see and, and, and all these things and, and you just take it for granted like you got another moment. All you have is right now. God has blessed us. We need to rejoice in the gift of salvation that God has given us. Amen. Amen. He has blessed us so. And we need to give him glory. We need to give him. Let's stand up on, not a lazy praise. I know you're tired. But let's stand up on our feet this, morning, this, this evening and give God a praise like he really saved your soul. Give him a praise like he really done something for you in your life. Give him a praise like you will really know him as your savior. 
give him a praise like 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 he done done some things for you i ain't talking about those that, that god that ain't did nothing for you i'm talking about those that god has done something for you and he's doing something in you give him praise i tell you he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy put your hands up in the air and give him some praise praise the lord y'all come on now give him praise this may be the last moment there may be someone here today see it wouldn't make much sense that you come to the seven last words and we talking about jesus and all that he did for us and you never ever ever prayed and asked him to come into your life what a shame if this will be your last moment your last moment that God would be calling out to you to give your life and you end up right before him and he said you know what on, on, on the seven last words at Fort Foot Baptist Church I had this preacher with a red tie on to catch your attention about the blood of Jesus to catch your attention that's that's the reason the, the blood of Jesus and Reverend Marcy with her red robe on to catch your attention to let you know about the blood of Jesus and and how he shed his blood for you there may be someone here today let me spell it out to you if you never prayed and said Lord I want to receive you as my Savior I believe that you came and that you died for me if you never pray I'm not talking about going to church I'm not talking about singing in a choir. I'm not talking about your, 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 your mothers or your fathers or your grandfathers or, or, or the relationship they have. I'm talking about you personally. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? You can know for sure. Would you know for sure? I'm not talking about, I think I might be all right. No, 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 no. That you know for a certain that you will go to be with heaven, be to have in heaven with the Lord. That's what that's what I'm talking to. If you never prayed that prayer, I'm talking about if you're a child, if you are an adult, you're in the middle age, you you know you're in the bridge, and you know you know I, whatever 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 area you in in a part of your life. If you never prayed that prayer, would you come? Would you come? Would you accept that gift that God has for you? I accepted the Lord when I was 17 years old. And I thank the Lord that he saved me at 17 because I probably wouldn't be here today. And the same with most, some of you here today. Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? And if you're here and you say, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not saved. I never prayed that prayer, but I'm a little shy. See, shyness ain't going to get you in heaven. But Jesus already did. He already did everything. He did everything for your salvation. I know it's late in the evening, but it'll be a lot later if you walked out the door. And this was your last opportunity. Your last opportunity. See those folks that was on that bridge in Baltimore? They didn't know that the bridge was going to fall off. And the same like with us. Life is like a vapor. It's very short. You're here today. They say here today, gone tomorrow. No, you could be here today and gone today. Would you come? If you never prayed that prayer, if you never asked Jesus to come into your life, would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? So that means everyone here, if you were to, if, you, if something were to happen and you would have died, you'd be going to be in heaven. Amen? If that's true, then wave at me like this. Wave at me. You know for a fact where you're going. You know where you're going. Amen. 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 God has blessed us tonight with some anointed. Ministers of God, God has some preachers in this house. We give God praise for his ministers. They have poured out their hearts, opened up the word of God, took us deep into the word of God, blessed our hearts on a good Friday. Thank God for all of you for sharing with us.
Thank God for each of you ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been blessed. Our hearts have been lifted. No wonder Jesus said, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. We have been blessed tonight. May these words sink deep into our heart as we remember and reflect upon the great love Jesus shared for us on the cross at Calvary. My God from heaven. Mm, mm, mm. Ephesians says, we were dead in sin and trespasses. Trespass, I went where I should not have gone. Sin, I didn't go where I should have gone. Worthy of a double condemnation. But we had minds that were disobedient, yielding to the flesh and not the spirit. But his great love mm, made all the difference in the world. Let us stand. We're going to ask the pastor from Freedom Way Baptist Church to come and give us our closing prayer and our benediction. <laughs> Along with his wife. Just come on. We're so glad to see y'all home. We'll be back this Sunday morning at the early sunrise at 6 a.m. We'll, we'll, Will I see you here or will you just be praying for me? 6 a.m., 7.30, and close out at 11 o'clock. Resurrection Sunday morning. I'll be looking for y'all. Reverend Larry Hintz, pastor of Freedom Way Baptist Church. And First Lady Franny Hintz. Recently installed a little while ago. Bless God. We pray your strength in the Lord. Can we praise God one more time for the word? For the preachers of the word? Amen. All hearts and minds are clear. As comfortable as you can be, would you touch one to another, please? Amen. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. Heavenly Father, we come at this time, dear Lord, first and foremost, just to say thank you. We thank you, dear Lord, for what our ears have heard and what our hearts have felt. We pray at this time, dear Lord, that you'll have us remember what you did on this day over 2,000 years ago. Prepare us not only to remember but to tell someone of your grace, your mercy, your unfailing love. We ask the Lord that you will pour back into the preachers that poured out for us. We ask also, dear Lord, that our homes will be in better spiritual condition than they were when we left. Bless this house, O oh Lord. Bless the pastor of this house. Bless the leadership of this place, dear Lord. Oh, let them have a high time in the Lord on Sunday, dear Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultlessly before his throne with exceeding joy. To the all-wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Henceforth and forevermore, let the church say amen. 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 God bless you. God keep you.